At some point in time, there should be something that strikes your spirit that says, no, the next person that comes to me sick, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry something with me that's going to break that stronghold of sickness off their body. I made up my mind when I'm getting into the ministry, when I got saved and called to the ministry, I told the Lord, if I'm going to follow this, I'm not doing things as an ordinary task-oriented career hireling type of minister where I'm just, you know, a refined motivational speaker and I tag on a few scriptures at the end just to make it biblical. I told the Lord, if I'm going to follow the call of God into the ministry, I need you to empower me with these supernatural abilities so that I can be different in my generation and that people that hear me speak, they know there's a notable difference on how you speak and what you do that causes people to be steered up with holy emotions and thereby are persuaded to faith in God. And that's what the gifts of the Spirit are designed to do, to persuade people to faith in God. The Bible says that the gifts of the Spirit are there for the edification of people, and the gifts of the Spirit, if properly used, will cause people who are unbelievers to come into services, to church meetings, fall on their faces, and report that God is truly among His people. Do you know that when you start operating these gifts of the Spirit, no matter to what God's called you to be as a business owner. You'll have other business owners come to you and say, God is truly with you. That's what Joseph had. Potiphar, by no means a Christian, a pagan in that generation. He said, God is with Joseph. He understood there's something supernatural about Joseph's life. If people around you don't see anything supernatural about your life, they'll not, have, they'll not have any desire to come to church with you. You'll just be bunched in with every other person that they come in contact with. But when they start to see radiating from you that glorious treasure of God, the power of God demonstrated through your life, when they start to visibly and evidently see that manifested in your life, there, there's a curiosity, there's an appeal now, there's a desire. And that's, what these, that's why God wants His church. Anybody in his church, whether you're the pinky toe of the body of Christ or you're the mouthpiece that God uses to announce his gospel in the generation that you're living in. It doesn't matter what part of the body that you are. Every part of the body is not only given access to these spiritual gifts, but God desires for you to covet earnestly these gifts of the spirit so that you can operate excellently in them. And I love how Paul uses that term. When he talks about how we're to uh, receive these gifts, it's not a passive term. It's not, hey, you know, God gives these gifts uh, at random. Nothing you can do to position yourself to be uh, in a place where you can receive these gifts. It's pretty much just a random selection. It's kind of like a lottery system in heaven. You ever watch uh, uh, Wheel of Fortune? They always had Yolanda Vega come out sometime during the commercial period and she would come and she'd do the Lotto 649 and she'd name all the numbers 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Oh, if, you know, if that was your number, you won the lottery. That's not how God distributes these gifts. Paul made it clear. You want the operation of these gifts to be flowing through you? effortlessly in your life? You want a grace to carry these gifts to your generation? He said, covet earnestly the greater gifts. That word covet is the Greek word zelu. Zelu in the Greek literally means to burn with fervent passion for something. To burn with a fervent passion to acquire something. I'm burning I'm burning. I, I don't want to be an ordinary minister that goes from church to church, gives out a bunch of encouraging words, but ultimately people come in blind and leave blind. People come in downcast, depressed, burdened by the devil, and there's nothing I can do to actually help them on a practical level. No, I made up my mind. I'm going to carry God's power to my generation. The Bible makes it clear in Psalm 71, 18, David said this, Lord, don't forsake me until I show your power to my generation, your mighty works to all who call, to all who come to you. There has to be a point in your life. There has to be a point in your life where this clicks with you, where you get tired 
of just keeping people in prayer, but there's no change. Where you get tired, where when people come to you with a load of problems, all you ever do is just, you know, give them a hug and pat them on the back and tell them, you know what, I'll keep you in prayer. You know, we're going to be, we'll, we'll add you to the prayer, line, prayer list. At some point in time, there should be something that strikes your spirit that says, no, the next person that comes to me sick, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry something with me that's going to break that stronghold of sickness off their body and minister God's healing power to them. There has to be a point in time where that happens. So let's read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's get in it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be ignorant. Isn't it funny that the very thing Paul says, don't get ignorant on, what happens? That's where people get ignorant on. That's where people get disconnected. Oh, we don't, you know, what's really important in life is not the gifts of the Spirit, it's the fruit of the Spirit. That's like saying, what's more important, breathing or eating? You'll find out, you stop one uh, and just do the other, you'll realize you need both to live. You need to eat and you need to breathe to live. So it's not pick and choose between the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit. Paul himself said, concerning the gifts of the Spirit, I bet you Paul by the Spirit understood there'd be a, a generation in, in the future that would talk as stupid as some people talk today. It's not, it's not about the gifts of the Spirit. You know, there's a lot of spiritually gifted people, but they got no character. I don't doubt it. There are a lot of gi spiritually gifted people that have no character. But just because you see some people not operating in a biblical function, of the, of the gifts of the Spirit in terms of like them being jerks and arrogant and they don't carry the, the fruit of the Spirit, just because someone carries gifts but has no fruit doesn't mean that the fruit is all that's important and we should disconnect from the gifts and discard the gifts. No, they're both equally important. And that's why Paul said don't get ignorant on them. Don't get ignorant on their definitions and don't get ignorant on their operations, on how to operate in these things. Because if you become ignorant in the operation, the operational use of these gifts, in that you just know I can list out all nine gifts of the Spirit, but I've never been exposed to anybody that operates in them. I've never seen it actually manifest before my eyes. Well, you're still ignorant to the spiritual gifts. And when you're ignorant to the spiritual gifts, you disqualify yourself from ever being used in that manner, in that capacity. And the gifts of the Spirit literally are the only thing that separate the practical religion of Christianity from any other religion. Because if you look at Muslims, they gather. If you look at Muslims, they have imams that give a word of exhortation from their Quran. You look at, at Muslims, they have their own form of church services. They have prayer meetings. They have everything that Christians have. And the definition of religion is literally just uh, a system of beliefs that promise people access to a higher power in life. And so if you remove the gifts of the Spirit and you compare and contrast Christianity from is, uh, to Islam, you essentially, there's nothing to argue the skeptic to show him that Christianity is any different. There's really nothing. The story, you look at, you read in the Quran, Jesus came, Jesus was born of a virgin, Jesus did miracles. But I'm talking about in terms of the practical operations of each religion on the earth today, outside of the gifts of the Spirit, there's nothing that distinguishes Christianity from Islam if you make void or ignore or neglect the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit literally are what separate us from every other religion on the earth because it's the gifts of the Spirit that unlock that dimension of God's power that allows us to be of impact to our generation. And if you look at Jesus' life, what separated him from every other religious teacher in his day? It was miracles. It was signs. It was when he went to Nathaniel, and by the discerning of spirits said, here's an Israelite indeed in whom there's no deceit. Nathaniel got on his knees and said, oh man, you're God. One, up, one minor use of the gift of discerning of spirits. And it convinced a man who had never met Jesus before to say, you're God. So even Jesus... Because you have people that say, you know, we got to be Christ-like. We got to be Christ-like. But they never talk about Christ's power. They never talk about the gifts of the Spirit that Jesus heavily relied on 
to, to make impact to the people in his generation. So to say that we ought to be Christ-like but ignore the gifts of the Spirit that were evidently in the life of Christ, it's like saying, you know, it's, it's essentially like separating Wayne Gretzky from hockey. You separate the functioning or the functional use of the gifts of the Spirit from Jesus Christ. It's like separating basketball from LeBron James or, or golf from Tiger Woods. You bring up Tiger Woods, you're automatically talking about golf. You bring up LeBron James, you can't get far without talking about basketball. You bring up Jesus Christ, you can't go anywhere without talking about his power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul says concerning gifts of the Spirit, don't let anyone backpedal you in making you think that they're not important or not as important. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant. What does that mean? Study to show yourself approved so that you can be in a position where God can use you. 